Welcome to the 23rd lecture in the series, Introduction to New Testament Textual Criticism. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray today for the lost souls throughout the world. Send your word to shine into every land where it's kept in the shadows. Guide your church to share the gospel with travelers, with students. Stir up a thirst for your righteousness in their hearts, and let it be filled as they surrender to Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Usually, when considering the evidence for rival readings, we consult list of witnesses in a textual apparatus. This group supports this reading, and that group supports that reading, and so forth. With hundreds of manuscripts under consideration, that is entirely understandable. But sometimes, especially when a manuscript supports a very unusual reading, it's helpful to resort to another approach. Get to know the individual witnesses to the text. Consulting the evidence directly can sometimes provide insights about specific readings that nothing else can, and account for the origin of some readings. Consulting the evidence directly can sometimes suggest historical steps in the history of a particular reading. Consulting the evidence directly can sometimes help researchers to appreciate the variety of ways in which the text has been transmitted. Consulting the evidence directly can sometimes reveal how a manuscript has been used. And consulting the evidence directly can sometimes even result in the correction of misreadings that earlier researchers made. Now let's meet some of the most unusual witnesses to the text of the New Testament. Links to most of these will be given at the end of the lecture. Consider Matthew 24.35 and Codex Sinaiticus, or Sinaiticus. Most manuscripts of Matthew say, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall by no means pass away. But in Codex Sinaiticus, this verse is not in the main text. It is added in the lower margin. Does this mean that the main text of Codex Sinaiticus echoes an exemplar that did not have verse 35? Well, consulting the evidence directly helps answer this question. When we look at the manuscript, we see that Matthew 24, 34 is the last verse of the last column on a page. This implies that the scribe lost his place in his exemplar when he turned the page of the manuscript he was making, and skipped verse 35 when he resumed writing on the opposite side of the page. Also consider a 0, 2, 1, 2. But this uncial fragment is unusual. Technically, it does not deserve to be listed as a manuscript of a continuous text New Testament book of books. It might be better to think of it as a, an anonymous patristic text. This small fragment, a fragment from a scroll, was found in 1933 at the site of dur when the city was being excavated in eastern, in eastern Syria. Now this witness was made before the year 256. How do we know? Because the city of dur which had been identified as, the, as having the earliest Christian church building, was destroyed in the year 256. When 0212 was published, its Greek text was identified as a combination of phrases taken from the Gospels, preserving the narrative about the death and burial of Jesus found in parallel passages in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. This led researchers to identify it as an early fragment of Tatian's Diatessaron. Some scholars have disagreed, interpreting the text as something from a, a different, otherwise unknown, Gospels harmony. Either way, it is unique among the manuscripts listed as New Testament uncials or, ma or magistrules. Third, consider lectionary 1276. It's, it's easy to overlook lectionaries. The textual apparatus of the Tyndale House edition of the Greek New Testament does not mention a single one. But lectionary 1276, a fragmentary palimpsest, is interesting and relatively early. Its production date has been assigned to the 500s. Even if that date is debatable, lectionary 1276 is undoubtedly one of the oldest Greek lectionaries in existence. Lectionary 1276 is part of the massive collection of materials found in the Geniza, our retirement home for manuscripts, of the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo, Egypt. Solomon Schechter organized and studied these materials beginning in 1896. He was joined by Charles Taylor. It appears that sometime around the 600s, give or take, a Gospels lectionary was made and it came into the possession of a Jewish community in Cairo, where its parchment was eventually recycled to hold a text 
of a Hebrew composition around the 800s. The background of lectionary 1276 testifies to the geographic range of its readings in the text of Matthew 10 and John 20. Fourth, consider the Gerima Gospels, or the Gerima Gospels. This is a two-volume copy of the Gospels written in Giz, or Ethiopic. When Europeans first encountered this manuscript in the mid-1900s, it was assigned to around the year 1000, or 1011. But as it received more attention, an early production date was suspected, and in the year 2000, researcher Jacques Mercier submitted two fragments from the manuscript to be radiometrically dated at Oxford University. Now, one fragment was dated to the period from 330 to 540, and the other fragment was dated from 430 to 650, so both fragments could have been produced in the early 500s. The verification of the production date of the Gerema Gospels has facilitated a much greater appreciation for its contents. Fifth, consider the Book of Kells. Now, the Book of Kells is so famous because of its artistry that it's easy to, to overlook it as a textual witness. Widely regarded as the most beautifully written of all Gospels manuscripts, the text in the Book of Kells might be considered just another copy of the Vulgate. For, for the most part, that's what it is. But it also has some readings that echo old Latin exemplars that predate the Vulgate. One of the readings in the Book of Kells, and several other Latin copies, occurs in Matthew 27, 49. After Matthew's report that some of the bystanders at Jesus' crucifixion said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. The very next thing that happens in most copies is that Jesus cries out with a loud voice and yields up his spirit. But in the book of Kells, before verse 50, there is more. It says, And another person took a spear and pierced his side, and there came forth water and blood. Now this is an approximate parallel to John 19.34. The significant difference is that in John, when Jesus is pierced, he is already dead. The, the soldiers pierce his side to remove any doubt that he is dead. The reading in the book of Kells appears to be an interpolation, inserted by a scribe trying to make a harmonization that the insertion was made at the wrong place before Jesus dies. But the originator of this reading cannot have been a Latin scribe because the same reading is found in Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, the two Greek manuscripts that form the backbone of the base text of the New Testament in the NIV and ESV. Now, as a side note, I have noticed that although the NIV and ESV relied very heavily on these two manuscripts, the reading of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus in Matthew 27 49 has not been adopted into their text, and as far as I can tell, is not even mentioned in the NIV and ESV in a footnote, even though it is supported by some other Alexandrian witnesses such as Codices C and L. If we reckon that witnesses that share the same readings tend to have the same origin, then the thing to see is that the witnesses with this relatively rare reading in Matthew 27 49 must be connected in some way, even though some of them represent a stratum of the Latin text in Ireland, and some of them represent a very, form, very early form of the Greek Gospels text used in Egypt. This connection is also suggested by similarities between some of the artwork in the Book of Kells and in the artwork that appears in some Coptic manuscripts. Which brings us to our sixth witness, the Fadden Moor Psalter. The discovery in 2006 of the Fadden Moor Psalter is another piece of evidence that increases the plausibility of a connection between a biblical text in Ireland and a biblical text in Egypt. The Fadden Moor Psalter is a very heavily damaged Latin copy of the Book of Psalms that was made in about the year 800. The parchment pages of the Fadden Moor Psalter were found along with a leather cover. It was found in a bog near the city of Tipperary. The discoverer, Eddie Fogarty, exercised remarkable skill and competence in preserving the manuscript once it was discovered. One of the interesting things about the cover is that there is definitely papyrus in the cover's lining. Papyrus in Ireland. Well, sometimes we cannot access the evidence directly because it does not exist anymore. This is probably the case with our seventh witness, Codex Gesensis. For a few decades after its discovery in Egypt in 1907, a small Gothic and Latin fragment with text from Luke 23 and 24 was kept in Germany. Unfortunately, it was reportedly destroyed as a result of bombing during World War II, but black and white photographs of the manuscript have survived. 
Similarly, when Lake Nasa was enlarged in the, at the southern border of Egypt around the year uh, 1970, many artifacts from the ancient site of Ferris were heroically rescued by a team of researchers from Poland. And they can still be visited at the National Museum in Warsaw. The summit inscriptions had to be left behind and were subsequently submerged. But photographs of them were taken, including a photograph of our ninth witness, an inscription that features the beginning and ending of each gospel. Even this small witness can help track the geographic spread of variants in these portions of text. The direct consultation of manuscripts can reveal things that cannot be seen in an ordinary textual apparatus. Some New Testament manuscripts have colophons that state when and where the manuscript was made. In some manuscripts, there are illustrations which identify the donor or sponsor of the manuscript. Our tenth witness, Greek manuscript 157, produced in 1122, has an illustration featuring the Byzantine emperor John II and his son Alexius, which pinpoints where the manuscript was initially used. The size of a manuscript, the quality of its writing materials, and the supplements to the text can sometimes provide important clues about a manuscript's background. One of the largest manuscripts of the Bible is the Latin Bible known as Codex Amiatinus, a 75-pound book. Its dedication page shows that, it, shows that it was made in Britain in the 700s, or that is what was shown before it was altered to appear to have come from somewhere else. Although Codex Amiatinus weighs 75 pounds, our twelfth witness is much larger, which is why it is called Codex Gigas, the very big book. It weighs in at 165 pounds and is three feet tall. Made in the 1200s, it contains the Latin text of the Bible and several other compositions, including works by Josephus. One of the things that makes Codex Gigas special is the ancient character of part of its New Testament text. For most of the New Testament, Codex Gigas has a fairly ordinary Vulgate text. But in the book of Acts, and in Revelation, it echoes an old Latin exemplar, or an old Latin ancestor. Outside the interest of New Testament criticism, textual criticism, but still worth mentioning, is the full-page picture of the devil in this manuscript, and the tradition that the devil himself helped make it. And by coincidence, the old Latin text in Codex Gigas, which is sometimes called the, the Devil's Bible, is related to the Latin text used by a 4th century bishop named Lucifer. Codex Gigas has something in common with the final witness we will consider today, and uh, these witnesses are collected together in, in a manuscript known as Codex Gilfrobitanus 64 Weisenburgensis. This manuscript and Codex Gigas both contain the text of Etymologies, a Latin composition written by Isidore of Seville around the year 600. It was a sort of manual for everything during the Middle Ages. In Codex Gigas, uh, Etymologies is presented as a text that was in the same volume as the Bible. In Codex Gilfrobitanus 64 Weisenburgensis, the Latin text of Etymologies is written on pages that had previously been part of several other manuscripts. Those other manuscripts contained different parts of the New Testament. One set of pages is from a Greek manuscript that was made in the 500s, known as Codex Gilfrobitanus A, also known as uh, 024, also known as Codex P of the Gospels. Another set of pages is from 026, also known as Codex Q, a Greek Gospels manuscript made in the 400s. And a third set of pages was taken out of a section of a Latin Gothic manuscript containing Romans 11 through 15, and this third set of pages is, ca is called Codex Carolinus from the 500s. So in addition to recycled pages taken from other books, we're looking at recycled pages from three New Testament manuscripts. The ink of these three manuscripts was washed off the parchment, and scribes then wrote etymologies on those parchment pages. Fortunately, some of the ink that was used by the scribes of 024 and 026 and Codex Carolinus adhered to the parchment and survived being washed. But except for places in the manuscript that were not used when the pages were recycled to hold the text of etymologies, even digital images of these palimpsests are very difficult to read. Electronic tools that help online viewers read layers of writing exist, such as the Mirador viewer, but sometimes there's nothing like in-person examination. Constantine Tishinov, the same researcher who obtained most of Codex Sinaiticus, examined the pages of 026 and 024 directly and published their contents in 1860 and 1869. 
An earlier researcher, F. A. Niddle, had already published the Latin and Gothic texts of Codex Carolinus in 1762. The witnesses to the text of the New Testament that I have mentioned in this, in this lecture all show, in one way or another, the advantages of direct consultation of the evidence. Today's researchers have an advantage that researchers two generations ago could, could only dream of, the ability to view high-quality digital images of hundreds of Greek New Testament manuscripts. This is the next best thing to viewing the manuscripts themselves. Now I'm going to uh, mention some links to manuscripts and manuscripts co collections. Some of these links are complicated, so instead of spelling them all out, I have added them in the captions. You should be able to cut a link from the captions and paste it in your computer's search bar. Codex Sinaiticus can be viewed page by page at codexsinaiticus.org. Codex Vaticanus can be viewed at the website of the Vatican Library, which is in the process of digitizing its collection of manuscripts. This includes very many Greek New Testament Greek manuscripts, including Papyrus 75, Papyrus 72, Codex S, 157, and many more, plus manuscripts in Latin, Syriac, Arabic, Armenian, and other languages. At the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, csntm.org, as of February 2021, pictures of almost 2,000 New Testament manuscripts including 0212, can be viewed online. About 700 are viewable in old images from microfilm, but many are high-quality photographs taken by research teams from CSNTM. The British Library has digitized over 100 continuous text Greek manuscripts and over 50 lectionaries, plus very many virginal manuscripts. Page views from over 200 manuscripts at St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai, taken with microfilm, are available to view online at the website of the Library of Congress. Also at the Library of Congress's website are microfilm page views from over 70 manuscripts in or near Jerusalem. Pictures of over 70 New Testament manuscripts, some in microfilm and some from photographs, can be viewed at the National Library of France, which can be navigated online using the Gallica website. It's sometimes helpful to use a manuscript's catalog number instead of its Gregory Allen number when using Gallica. Uh, both identification numbers are provided in helpful lists at Wikipedia. The Kenneth W. Clark collection of Greek manuscripts at Duke University has over 100 Greek manuscripts, many of which have been fully digitized. The online Goodspeed Manuscript Collection at the University of Chicago, one of the first institutions to put its manuscripts online, has digital page views of more than 40 New Testament manuscripts, plus the forgery that was once known as Archaic Mark. Archaic Mark was included in the textual apparatus of the 27th edition of the Nestle Allen compilation as minuscule 2427. To see the Book of Kells page per page, visit the link in the captions. It's also featured in several videos on YouTube. Uh, several online materials tell about the Fat and Morris Psalter. Uh, John Gillis presented a detailed lecture about it in 2016. Pictures of Codex Gesensis can be found at a website provided by Christian T. Peterson. A 2003 analysis of its Gothic text by Magnus Snedel is available at academia.edu. The wall inscription at Ferris that contains the beginnings and endings of the four Gospels can be found in F. L. Griffith's Oxford Excavations at Nubia, in, in Nubia, in the 1927 volume of Annals of Archaeology and Anthropology in Plate 64, subtitled Anchorite's Grotto. Photographic page views of Codex Amiatinus are at the digital repository of the Laurentian Library in Florence, Italy. The New Testament portion begins on page 796, and a video about Codex Amiatinus is on YouTube. Uh, some digital page views of Codex Gius are at the website of the National Library of Sweden, and it can also be viewed page by page at the World Digital Library. And more New Testament manuscripts in Greek, Latin, Armenian, and other languages can also be viewed at the World Digital Library website. The palimpsest that includes 024, 026, and Codex Carolinus can be seen at the website of the Herzog August Library. And Tischendorf's transcriptions of 024 is in Volume 6 of Monumenta Sacred Inedita at Google Books, and so is Tischendorf's transcript of 026 in Volume 3. I hope you will be blessed by consulting the evidence. Thank you.